welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. You know, sometimes I think of Jason Hartman as a walking encyclopedia on the subject of creating wealth. Well, you're probably not far off from the truth, Penny, because Jason actually has a three-book set on creating wealth that comes with 60 digital download audios. Yes, Jason has that unique ability to make you understand investing the way it should be. It's a world where anything less than 26% annual return is disappointing. I love how he actually shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I also like how he teaches you to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And the entire set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered at a savings of $94. That's right, and to get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series, complete with over 60 hours of audio and three books, just go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. It's my pleasure to welcome Bob Levenstein. Uh, he is CEO of Cruise Compete, and this is a very unique business model that allows consumers to shop for the best cruise deal, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Bob, welcome. How are you? I'm doing very well, Jason. Thanks for having me. Well, good, good. Since we do talk about travel, I always like to give our listeners a sense of geography. Where are you located? I am actually located in Des Moines, Iowa, about as far as you can get from a cruise port. When I go to travel conferences, I am always the person who is furthest from the ocean. <laughs> That's funny. Well, uh, let's, let's not have it be that way for our listeners. So tell us about Cruise Compete. What inspired the idea? Well, you know, I had uh, been taking a, number of, taking a number of cruises. And what I had learned in shopping around for them, being on the, on the boards where people discuss things, is that the same cabin on the exact same ship, um, you might be able to get for a different rate for a lower price, or you might be able to get additional benefits and amenities like onboard credit or a cabin upgrade or even simple, something as simple as a bottle of champagne in your cabin. It all depends on uh, which travel agency you book with. And at the time, uh, I was running another company uh, called uh, Nation Job, which was one of the first uh, online job listing services. And it just really occurred to me that it was really a very similar type of application to be able to, you know, one company was about people want to find jobs and they go on and they can search to find them. Uh, another company want to be, another company people want to be matched with travel agencies to find good deals on cruises. So um, with a couple of partners, uh, launched Cruise Compete back in 2003. And we just had our, our 10 year anniversary and more than 11 million uh, quotes have gone through, uh, gone through the site in that, in that amount of time. And so you were saying before we started recording that these are all through travel agencies rather than That's directly right. through the cruise lines. Now, now, why is that? Well, you're always going to get a better deal booking with an agency than booking directly with the line. The cruise line has a lot of incentive. Uh, the, the travel agents actually sell anywhere from uh, 70 to 95% of a cruise line's inventory. Um, they're not selling directly for the most part. In fact, there are even a couple lines that will not sell direct at all, a couple of smaller ones. And depending on the relationship they have with the agency, uh, whether or not they have group space reserved, 
just how smart they are about uh, about the codes and the you know the fair codes and coupons and ways to get you deals. The travel agency the travel agents uh, can can get you more for your money. Now, isn't that a, a little? Don't we have to be a little counterintuitive there? Because one would think, well, let's disintermediate the travel agent and save the commission. They're probably only getting maybe what five percent or something, right? So it's not uh, a it's not a big agency, amount. Travel agency commissions are actually around fifteen percent. Oh, fifteen percent for uh, cruises. Okay, and it good. can go up from there depending on uh, on um, things like uh, overrides or uh, what they call co-op advertising. But the um, Cruising is a, it's a much more complex travel to buy than just booking a hotel room. There's a lot more to understand, and uh, the guidance of a travel agent really uh, really means a lot to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And you know, but but it's complicated to book multi-leg airplane trips too, right? I guess the cruise is just even more complicated than that, right? Well, you really have to have have more understanding of uh, of the market and. When you have a growing market like the cruise business, you constantly have to bring new people in. If you're on your third cruise, your fifth cruise, your tenth cruise, you probably pretty you can probably uh, know enough to make most of the decisions yourself. But it's really nice to have somebody who's been trained, who uh, who's been on different lines, and can really has been around the industry, can get, really give you some good advice. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I certainly see the need for travel experts and agents and so forth. So, uh, not, not doubting that. Yeah, well. Cruise lines do too, so that's that's why they give them the opportunity to uh, to offer some better rates. And so the way our site works is, as a consumer, you come in, you have all kinds of tools to help you find the uh, cruise that's right for you. And when you put in a quote request, that request is immediately available in uh, in the account of actually hundreds of, of travel agencies. We have about 500 agencies on the site. They can focus on the lines that uh, that they know the most about. Somebody may be an expert on Royal Caribbean. Somebody may be an expert on a luxury line like uh, Oceania or, uh, or Silver Sea. And so they can very easily find those requests and, uh, and offer quotes and offer their expertise. As a consumer, then you can go in, you can see, uh, you can compare the, uh, compare the offers. Uh, one might be a little less money. One might have more, uh, you know, sometimes the quotes might be, the price quotes might be the same, but you can get more onboard credit or different amenities. Uh, and you can also read about the agencies. You can see consumer reviews. The agencies can communicate to you, you know, I've been on the ship and I can tell you a lot of things about it. There's a lot of value they can provide. But as a consumer, you remain anonymous. You have the contact information for the agents. They don't have your contact information. And if and when you decide uh, you want to contact somebody directly for more information or to book, you pick up the phone or you email uh, or you can even chat live with the agents to get more information uh, or to book your cruise. And what's the rationale behind the agent not having your information? Is it just so they won't follow up and they won't bug you, you know, unless you want them to? I think that's the way. You know, that's when we started this, we really looked at how would we like to be treated? You know, how do we like to do business? Um, or how do we like to shop? Uh, and I think that's exactly right. You know, you don't, um, you're not making a commitment when you put in a quote request that, oh, gee, I'm going to get 19 emails uh, from different people and uh, my phone's going to be ringing off the hook of somebody trying to sell me something. The consumer should be in charge of the process. And, you know, that goes toward the anonymity. It goes toward the ability to, you know, read about the agency and read how previous customers have rated that agency before you even decide to talk to them. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. And so, is is there any type of metric that you track in terms of actual savings, or is it more about amenities, onboard credit, the things that you mentioned, or up or room upgrades, or it, it really varies line by line. Sometimes, uh, you know, some lines uh, allow looser, allow the agents to do more uh, for the uh, for the consumer to get their business. Some lines allow less. But you know, sometimes the savings can uh, can be you know in the in the 10% range, in the 15% range, uh, on certain lines. On other lines, you're maybe only saving you know 5%, but you're talking about 5% on a on a very expensive purchase. So it 
um, uh, you know, it's definitely a benefit, uh, especially over, you know, going to the line or, or just paying retail. Okay, cool. Good. Well, any thoughts on uh, the different cruise lines out there, you know, be, beyond uh, what you do specifically on the site? You know, any tips on cruising? Any thoughts about different cruise lines and what they're offering? Who's good? Who's bad? And, you know, I want to ask you about the one thing, plaguing cruises, too, which is these infections you keep hearing about. But, you know. Well, to, we can start there if yeah. you like. Okay, yeah, start, uh, start you know, there. Let's not end with that one because <laughs> that's one of the, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, of course, you know, I, I just want to make the disclaimer. The media plays this stuff up and they make it seem like a bigger deal than it is probably. I understand that. There's zillions of people cruising every year, and you only hear about a couple of stories. But anyway, go, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, norovirus, it's not the first time it's hit a cruise ship, and it won't be the last. The reason you're hearing about it is because of a quirk in maritime law. And maritime law it basically says that if 3% of people uh, have the same, uh, on a ship, have the same disease or the same issue, you have to report that to the CDC in this country. So norovirus is actually an incredibly common virus. If you've had the 24-hour flu, the stomach flu, um, most of the time when you think you have food poisoning, it's not actually food poisoning. It's actually norovirus. Uh, on average, Americans get it about once every three, four years. If 3% of the people at a hotel had it, you wouldn't hear about it. If 3% of people at Disneyland had it, you wouldn't hear about it. If 3% of people at the stadium had it, you wouldn't hear about it. Yeah, oh, that's but interesting. Yeah, they, they pick on it because all the people it. are corralled in one place, and they, they can quantify that easier, can't they? They don't disperse as quickly. I think that's part of it. Yeah. And right. there's, certainly, you know, there's certainly an argument to be made that it's you know, in, a, in close quarters. It's likely to be transmitted more. But that's not the only place where it gets transmitted. This is an incredibly common, after the common cold, this is the most common thing people get. So, yes, it can happen, uh, and the cruise lines do not do a very good job, I think, uh, on PR, helping people understand that, look, this is something that happens. They didn't, you know, most of these people, often uh, people have it before they get on the ship, you know. So, but it is an element of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the cruise game, and uh, it's something they have to deal with. On the plus side, though, uh, bad PR, and there's been an awful lot of that over the last few years, generally means better deals. And there's some deals out there right now that are really just incredible, especially you know, for February and March. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, cruise lines have increased their they, – they, they didn't quite have enough capacity in the uh, Caribbean last year, and they overcorrected. And there's just a tremendous amount of additional capacity. And prices are are very very low for this yeah. time of year. So the consumers can definitely work that to their benefit, right? Oh, no question. Yeah. About it. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Good. Good to know. Talking about offers for you know six hundred and fifty dollars per person for a seven night cruise in a balcony cabin. That's amazing. On a, on a new ship like the. And, and yeah, and a new ship too, like like what? Uh, like the Norwegian Epic or the Breakaway. Both of those are, uh, in fact, I'm looking at going on the Epic myself on these uh, these prices. You know, these are brand new, very highly rated ships, and they're uh, they're just under capacity. So they've got cabin space, the lines cut prices, and uh, you know you have a lot of opportunity there. Carnival too has taken quite the beating uh, PR wise. Most yeah, of it not as, deserved. As, as maybe they should. No, you're going to say not deserved, huh? <laughs> I thought after that um, one incident. Some of it. Some of it. <laughs> I mean, you know, one inc- an incident happens. And, uh, yeah, well, part of the problem for Carnival was uh, this incident in, uh, in the Gulf uh, last year got so much PR that any time any little thing happened, it popped back in the news. And you heard about it again, you heard about it again, you heard about it again. But I've been on, I don't know, four or five Carnival cruises, never had a problem, uh, never saw any norovirus, never saw any safety issues. It's generally an incredibly safe vacation. And tell us the maybe a little bit about the the characteristics of, you know, maybe some of the bigger cruise lines. Back when I took my first Carnival cruise quite a while ago, that used to be known as the party ship, and, and you know, a lot of singles wanted to go on Carnival cruises. Now, they seem to have changed their image quite a bit. Who, who's known for what nowadays? You know, luxury. I mean, I've been on Crystal Cruises. That's a, a luxury, higher-end cruise, obviously. Uh, sure. But g- give us some of those characteristics, if you would. Just uh, sure, I'd be happy to lay it out for you. Uh... Carnival, the uh, you know Carnival does still strive for a lower, uh, a younger, sorry, not lower, younger uh, audience, younger crowd. Although 
it really depends a lot on the ship and on the itinerary. Uh, if you go on a three-night cruise, you're going to see a lot more younger people and a lot more singles than you would on, on say, a two-week cruise. Carnival has been really instrumental in bringing a lot of people into the industry because what they've done is they've taken their older and smaller ships, they've put them in ports you can drive to, and they tend to do three-night, four-night, five-night cruises. Um, it's cheaper to get on them. Uh, so that you know, younger people can often afford less expensive things, uh, and it's less of a commitment. So it's it's you know three nights versus seven, maybe you're not you know you're not spending all your vacation days in one place. So it's a way for to get people introduced to uh, to cruising. Carnival uh, Norwegian and and Royal Caribbean tend to be the more you know the more mainstream lines they refer to or contemporary, which frankly means nothing to me, but that's just one of the categories they uh, uh they like to uh, like to use. And uh you know, it's more it tends they tend to be more active crowds, uh, a little bit younger. But see one of the nice things about going on a very large ship is you can have whatever kind of vacation you want. Um I've had vacations on very similar ships where, you know, one trip we close down the disco at three AM every night and another one uh, you know, I work out twice a day and um, you know, spend a lot more time relaxing. There's plenty of, you know, so you can really find the types of folks on the on board that you want to be be with. Um, you know, going with if I'm taking my taking my son on this next trip, who's seven, we'll be doing different things and focusing on different things. But it's but there's so much available on these ships in terms of entertainment, in terms of relaxation. You can do what you want. You can find the vacation you want. It's one of the reasons why uh, cruise ships are a great choice for uh, you know family reunions or a multi generational vacation. There's stuff for the grandparents to do. There's stuff for the uh, the teens to do. There's stuff for the adults and uh, and the kids. Step up generally from uh, from those three lines uh, would be uh, princess, and then a little bit of a half step up from there would be uh, Holland American Holland America and uh, Celebrity. So these are just, just a little bit more upscale lines. There's a little bit more focus on the food and the service. Um, there may be, there might be a little bit less going on in the evening because you're going to cater to a somewhat older crowd. Uh, but those are a couple of, uh, of, uh, of very nice options. Again, it doesn't mean that a younger family isn't going to isn't going to enjoy sailing on those lines. It's just going to be a little bit of a different experience. Uh, and it depends what's important to you. You may go into the restaurant on a, on, you know, on a Carnival or a Royal and the main restaurant and think everything's wonderful. If you are maybe more focused on the food, you may decide that you like something else better. It really just depends on, on personal preference and what's of interest to you. Going a, a step up then from, uh, from uh, Holland and Celebrity, which are known as, uh, as premium lines, Princess is sometimes classified as premium, sometimes it's classified as mainstream. It just depends on who's doing the counting, I guess. There are uh, smaller, more boutique uh, uh, luxury lines. These lines sail smaller ships. Uh, they tend to sail longer itineraries. Uh, they're often more all-inclusive uh, in that uh, you're not the drinks may, you know, your drinks may be included, for example. These would be lines like uh, Azamara, which is Royal Caribbean's entry into the upscale market, uh, Seaborn, which is owned by Carnival Corp., lines like uh, Oceania and Regent, which are owned by uh, Prestige, uh, or uh, Silver Sea, which is an independent, uh, at least for the moment. There's some talk there's, uh, there might be some acquisitions in the, in the works out there. But these, these ships are uh, it's more of a country club type of an atmosphere, up to a, um, you know, depending on the line, Crystal, it's a little more formal and fancier, slightly older, same with Silver Sea, uh, whereas Oceania is more, just sort of think the kind of affluent adults you see around the, you would meet at a, you know, on the balcony at a country club uh, watching people play golf, that kind, of a, that kind of a thing. And those lines tend to be a little more destination oriented. They'll, they'll spend a little more time in port being able to uh, to explore there a little bit more rather than just sort of the fun and sun or the the sea alaska kind of a uh, uh, kind of a cruise then you also have uh, river cruising which is a very hot sector and is growing it's much 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 smaller than the uh, ocean uh, part of things but uh, it's growing pretty rapidly and in these ships uh, you're mostly sailing on the rivers uh, cruising the rivers of europe they're much smaller ships they may only take in you know from 24 to 200 people uh, on board 
But the neat thing about it is you're, you're docking right in the center of the city. So the, 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 uh, the boat stops and you're there. So you can get off and do a lot more cultural things. It's much more, it's more intimate in terms of getting to know the people on board uh, the ship. You have a lot fewer amenities. How, how, how many passengers on those? Uh, anywhere from you know 25 to 170, 200. But it's a really interesting way to see Europe. Uh, or and also they have you know they have sailings in uh, in uh, Asia as well uh, and Russia. Um, just a very interesting way to see things that that you you wouldn't see just stopping at a seaport and getting off. Um, another bonus with that too is uh, depending on I don't the euro is not as strong as it was, but for a while. Uh, the euro was so strong compared to the dollar, it made it very, very expensive to vacation there. But if you buy your cruise in dollars, um, you know, all your food and your lodging is taken care of in dollars. And often it's a, uh, um, not only is it just a unique vacation, but it's a, it's a cost-effective one as well. Are uh, Windjammer cruises, what are they doing nowadays? I don't think they exist anymore. Oh, they're gone, huh? Okay. Yeah, did anyone take them um, over? And is, any, is anyone running those? Because I, I ask you because I haven't heard of them lately, and I never went on one of those uh, barefoot cruises, as they say. Someone probably purchased them and is running all those ships, I would assume, right? Or maybe uh, um, maybe that market just didn't great. work. Maybe it didn't pencil out. Yep. Uh, September 2007 was suspended from further operations. Suspended. These assets were auctioned off. Oh, bankruptcy. Four ships yeah. the operator all laid up and were left in a neglected state of condition, according to Wikipedia. I'd like to tell you I had that memorized. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the beauty of the internet. You don't have to know anything nowadays. You just search it. <laughs> It's, it's, there you go. It's awesome. But you know what I wanted to ask you is also about different routes and so forth. If you had any opinions on, and you did allude to it a couple of times, but, you know, any other thoughts on different routes? You know, you covered, unless you sure, had anything else sure. you want to say on cruise lines. But I, I think you... Yeah, um, well, uh, personally, I, I think there are a couple different things to look at. You know, first off, you can take a look at what cruises leave close by, close to you, you know, wherever you happen to be located. Being in Iowa, of course, nothing leaves close to me. <laughs> well, then, then uh, it makes them all equal. You know, cruise ports all up and down the East Coast and, uh, and the Gulf Coast. So you have some options there in terms of being able to drive and cruise, which saves a significant, you know, saves a significant amount of money, uh, especially if you're, it's you know, more than a couple people. So that's the first thing to take a look at. I think I like going out of, going out of Miami um, because there's a, lot of, there's, there's a lot of choice. It tends to keep the prices down a little bit. You're starting with relatively warm weather, because, for example, at one point I, you know, cruised out of New Orleans, uh, where your first day, your, you know, the first day and the last day, it was pretty chilly. And this was, you know, this was New Orleans in March, early March, I believe, a number of years ago. Cruising out of San Juan is uh, is a really nice option to uh, go and see some islands, because you're starting in the southern, you know, in the in the Caribbean. And you go south from there. There are just some really nice places down there, like St. Kitts, Grenada, and just a little bit more of an exotic, uh, uh, exotic part of the Caribbean, I think. And that's nice. You can all you can get some really good cruise fares, but that can be offset by the uh, the flights cost more because you're off. You're generally you're probably sailing. You're probably flying to Miami and then having to go another you know two three hours to Puerto Rico. Um, which is, is, I think, a bit of a negative, it, it, unless you've got, you know, frequent flyer miles or, or some way to get there cheaper. So I like, you know, I like to, to try to keep the, uh, keep the travel days relatively short getting there, try to start someplace warm. Uh, if you're going in the winter and your goal is to get away from the cold, and I think this year that's what everybody's looking to do. Almost no matter where you are in the country, it's uh, it's unbelievably cold out there. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good advice. Well, the website is cruisecompete.com. Cruise compete like competition. Cruisecompete.com. And uh, Bob, any final words you want to say before you go? Uh, nope. I've uh, I've enjoyed being on and chatting with you, and I uh, hope uh, hope to uh, see some of your listeners uh, on our website. Yeah, yeah. Happy cruising, everyone. Thanks, Bob. Great show. Thank you. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com.
Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.